listeners, Rick and I are on a much needed vacation with our respective families. And we thought while we were gone, we'd provide a different voice for you. I'm very excited that one of our longtime listeners has begun his own podcast as a result of listening to ours. It's called Silver Bullet Survivor. I listened recently to his episode entitled Kids Say the Darndest Things, and I was touched by his perspective. Jack, the host, is not a mental health professional nor an attorney, but as I've come to know him, he has great internal wisdom about his children and what they need from him. I think you will enjoy hearing a dad's perspective on many of the things we discuss on our show. It's personal. It's not glamorous or well-polished. It's just Jack, and he speaks from the heart. I hope this will be an interesting listen for you as you contemplate your own attitudes toward your story and how it affects your children. Now, without further ado, I present The Silver Bullet Survivor. Welcome to the Silver Bullet Survivor Podcast. I'm Jack, a father of two young children. This is my story of surviving an abusive marriage that ended with false allegations of domestic violence, a restraining order, parental alienation, and post-separation abuse. I hope my story will help you or someone you know survive this journey. Hey, welcome to another episode of Silver Bullet Survivor Podcast. My name is Jack. On this episode, we're going to talk about when kids say the darnest things, not the sitcom. But chances are, if you have kids and you're going through the situation, you're going to hear some pretty interesting things from your kids. You know, there's a term I'm sure all of you have heard it before. It's called parental alienation. And I would advise you not to bring this up to a court professional because or a legal professional, unless you're talking to your attorney. But the reason being is because this is an overused term. And it's a diagnosis that requires a clinician to test for it. And it's also very hard to prove. And the bar from a legal perspective of parental alienation is really, really high, like really high. And chances are, like, none of you will meet that bar. We're talking like years of not talking to your parents, years of like, you know, bad mouthing one parent when there's no base to do that. We have to prove that there's no basis. Maybe, you know, the courts think maybe your child hates you because you were abusive. Well, you have to kind of prove that out. You have to prove it in a legal sense. And that's really hard to do. But setting all that aside, it's a thing. And what I'm talking about is not parental alienation as a diagnosis. What I'm talking about is parental alienation as a pattern of behavior. Okay, there's behavior that encourages alienation. Okay, and it runs the gamut. There are really small things like bad mouthing the other parent. Some may say that's really big. And, you know, my situation is actually kind of small. There's a lot more insidious things that have happened in my situation. Or it could be really serious. My kids have said some of the worst things I've heard in my life. You know, Daddy, you're a bad guy. That's actually not that serious on the grand scheme of things. But, Daddy, you're a bad guy. Daddy, you used to yell at Mommy. Daddy, you used to hit me when I was little. Do you remember? Daddy, Mommy thinks you're trash. Daddy, Mommy said no hug. Daddy, Mommy said no kiss. Daddy, Mommy said no sugar, no hot chocolate, no candy, no jelly, no ice cream. Daddy, Mommy said no TV, no movies. All all these things are things that I heard from my kids. But, I mean, what can you do? You know, are you going to tell a lawyer? The lawyer is going to argue that the kids are being alienated. Well, show proof. You can't show proof. You have to go through the rules of evidence. And again, it's an exercising futility of trying to argue this. So you're just going to have to learn how to respond to your kids in a way that doesn't traumatize them. Okay. Probably the worst thing that my kids have said was back when I was on supervised visitations. I had three hours on Saturdays and three hours on Sundays. And because of the limitations of the supervised monitor schedule, I could only see my kids every other Saturday. So one week it was Saturday and one week it it was Saturday and Sunday. I'm sorry, I could only see them every other Sunday. So every Saturday, every other Sunday. So the first week I had them, I saw them on Saturday. It was the first time I've seen them in two and a half months, I think. And it was a lot of anticipation, a lot of anxiety on my part. But my kids were affectionate. And this is the first time I ever talked to him in two and a half months after being an everyday present father. So that was a bit of an emotional trip. 
the second day of supervised visitations was on a sat- the following Saturday, and we decided to meet at a um, at a museum. And my ex was performing in her performative ways of acting like the abuse victim, all these things, and being so scared. So we had to go. We had to go through a whole song and dance. So what happened was I arrived early and texted the supervised monitor, and she told me to park a couple blocks away. So I did. Waited for my ex to drop the kids off with the supervised monitor, and my ex drove away. And then the supervised monitor was sending me a text saying, you can now come. And a couple minutes later, I drove up, I parked, and usually I would drop to my knees and open my arms. My kids would run into my arms, and I would give them a big hug. This time, I dropped to my knees, opened my arms, and my kids ran to me and stopped about maybe eight feet away. And then they both put their arms up in an X, and they both said in unison, No, 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 we don't want to hug you. You hit us when we were little, remember? And at the time, my kids were four and five. So, you know, obviously, though, they were, they were performing what they had rehearsed with their mom. But one aspect of supervised visitations is that you can't really ask questions to your kids about what happened, right? Because that's a slippery slope to interrogating your kids. They don't want to see me interrogate them. Who told you that? Who was she with? Who did your, like, why did your mom say that? Why did you do that? And obviously that's very traumatic for the kids. And so people don't want you to see that. So they don't like it when you ask the kids questions. Instead, they want to see you redirect. So distracting the kids, oh, hey, look at that duck, or hey, look at that bird, or hey, let's go inside the museum, or hey, I'll read you a book. Doing something to get their mind off of whatever it is that they're thinking about that's causing them this this discomfort, this anxiety. So um, anyway, after my kids said that, I asked them, is someone telling you not to hug daddy? I was chastised, and then we moved on. A couple minutes later, my daughter asked me, daddy, are you going to take us on Sunday? And I responded with, yeah, I'm going to see you on Sunday. We're going to have a lot of fun. Then her eyes went big, and she looked very fearful, and she told me, No, Daddy, don't take me on Sunday. My mommy's going to die. I don't want my mommy to be dead. Don't take me on Sunday, please. My daughter said that probably ten times that day, and thankfully, she is an innocent angel, and she said the words, Mommy's going to die. I don't want my mommy to be dead. Please don't take me. I think what had happened was, her mom told her, if daddy takes you on Sunday, mommy's going to die and traumatize my daughter so that my daughter would show trauma to the supervised monitor about me taking her the next day. Hope, I don't think my ex realized that my daughter was going to say that mommy's going to die. I just think, you know, I just think she wanted my daughter to say, no, no, please don't take me. Don't take me. Don't take me. No, no, no. I don't want to go. That is trauma that my daughter still lives with a year and a half later and will likely live with for the rest of her life. I think now she's gotten over it. I don't want to say got over it, but she now kind of realizes that mom's not going to die if daddy comes to see her because now I have 50-50 and she comes to me every every couple of days. And so far, mommy hasn't died. And so her belief in that mommy's going to die has maybe gone down a lot. But it's still a very traumatic thing for, for a five-year-old to think about. Again, I couldn't ask my daughter anything because that would be akin to interrogating her. So, I mean, what can I do? I could just just redirect her. Hey, oh, mommy's, oh, that's interesting. Mommy's not going to die. Let's go inside the museum. I mean, now looking back, I I can have the conversation very easily now. But back then, I mean, what do I do? Like, I I mean, I don't know. I'm not taking, I don't, at that point, I didn't even know there was a thing as parenting classes or hiring a parenting coach. So I was just winging it. Like doing whatever the supervised monitor was to, like, I was not, I was avoiding the behaviors that the supervised monitor told me not to do. That was it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what to say after that. So when the kids say those things, you have to act like it's not a big deal, honestly. You know, my kids have said, you know, daddy, you're a bad guy. Daddy, mommy says you're scary. Daddy, mommy says that uh, you yelled at us or you hit us or things like that. And the more you react naturally, the more you want to lash out and tell them things about their mom that they probably shouldn't hear, but you want to tell them because you want to get it off your chest. The more you do that, the more right mommy becomes or your co-parent, whoever that may be, whatever gender that may be. You don't want to react because if you react, then you become the person that your co-parent describes you as. 
Instead, you have to rise above that. And one professional told me that I kind of have to act like the fun uncle. Like, you know, the kind of uncle that just has fun with the kids and doesn't have to deal with any of the crap, doesn't have to change diapers, doesn't have to do that stuff, just takes them out to Disneyland and buys them good food to eat, all that stuff. So just be that uncle. When the kids say horrible things, just laugh it off. So my son said, you know, Daddy, Mommy said you're a bad guy. I asked him, well, you know, do you think I'm a bad guy? He said, no. I said, okay, well, thank you, buddy. I think I don't think Daddy's a bad guy either. You know, thank you for saying that. I don't think you're a bad guy. You know, I don't think Mommy's a bad guy. Yeah, no one here is a bad guy. That's funny. And let's, you know, just move on. One time my kids came to me, that's a couple months ago now. Kids came to me and they said, Daddy, Mommy says you're trash. <laughs> and I just had to laugh. Like, oh, that's funny. Like, would you believe mommy if mommy said that daddy's an elephant? And I kind of acted like an elephant or things like that. They started laughing and they said no. And I said, okay, well, yeah, you know, mommy says some funny things sometimes. Um, That's funny. Anyway, let's do something else. Whereas if I wanted to react in the way that I wanted or if I react in the way that I wanted to, well, your mommy's a bitch and she's done, she's doing all this stuff and she's, well, that's going to traumatize the kids. And my goal of having the kids escape this without trauma would not be met. I would have failed at that goal. So in order for you to succeed and in order for you to respond in a healthy, mature manner, in a way that your kids will not get traumatized, you have to kill your ego. Unfortunately, my ex sent three men to intimidate me at a child exchange one time because she wasn't like, she didn't like the way that I was talking to her on these messaging apps and basically what i was doing is i was i was wanting to exercise a visitation that i had that was scheduled for me and she didn't want that and we we're going back and forth and i was being very firm and very clear she didn't like that and so she sent men to intimidate me in front of the kids at a child exchange so being the badass that i am i escaped that situation without anyone being hurt without any incident and I also think I escaped the situation without my kids being traumatized. They were they were terrified in the situation, but I don't think they remember that now because their dad's such a badass. <laughs> but I remember when I got my kids in the car and I was putting their um, I was putting them in the car seats. They said, "Daddy, mommy says you're scary." And I looked at my son and I said, "Do you think daddy's scary?" And he smiled at me and he just started laughing. He said, no. I told him, yeah, well, you know, I don't think I'm scary. You know, and I think that, um, you know, it's only important what you think about daddy, not someone else. And then we had a good time. So you have to rise above the conflict and you have to put your children's emotional state at the forefront of everything that you do. And to my kids, I am happy. I am smiling all the time. I'm happy-go-lucky. Nothing hurts me, and that's the father that my kids deserve, and I always try to be the father that I want them to think of me as. Does that make sense? There's this phrase out there, uh, there's a saying, I want to be the person that my dog thinks I am. For me personally, I want to be the person that my kids deserve, and the person that they deserve is so much better than who I really am. So I have to try, like hell to be that person that they deserve. And that means putting aside all ego. That means not engaging in conflict, even though engaging would be so sweet or it would be so justified. Yeah, kids don't deserve that. Whatever conflict there is, you kind of have to internalize it and obviously document as much as you can because at some point it may bleed over into the legal arena. Chances are it won't. But in some cases, it may. And if it does, you want to be prepared. All that to say is my kids, when the men were sent to intimidate me, what had happened was one, two men got out of the cars. My ex didn't show up, by the way. There were three men, my two kids and me. And I was picking the kids up. Two men got out of the car and held on to my kids. And one man came over and accosted me, telling me I shouldn't talk to my ex like that. And they did this in the police station parking lot, but away from the cameras. Sneaky, sneaky. Little did they know, I had a dash cam set up, strategically placed, so the dash cam would record the entire incident, and it did. So I have that evidence. But, long story short, my kids witnessed a man coming to talk to me, and in a very aggressive manner. And 
they didn't see their dad engage. And I was actually kind of terrified that they would witness their dad getting hit and beaten by these three men. That was what I was worried about. Not so much about me getting hurt. I was worried about my kids seeing their dad get hurt. Uh, but nothing happened. Again, because I'm a fucking badass motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, the kids live life now, probably not even remembering that day. So I did my job. And when I talked to my ex about it, I sent her a message. I said, look, you sent three men to intimidate me. I will not be intimidated. And I will not talk about our situation with any man that you send. And then her response was to call me a coward, call me not a real man, and tell me that these men are the children's guardians. They're there to protect the children. And basically insinuating that I'm an interloper, that I am persona non grata, and all those things. Well, sorry to say, I, you know, the kids come from me. You know, half of them come from me. And I want them to be proud of the half that comes from me, at least. And so I'm doing everything I can for them to feel proud of that. And despite her shenanigans, she's lost that battle. I have a very strong bond with both kids now. Hey, listeners, you've probably heard us talking about our new Hump Day Help support group that meets every Wednesday at noon Eastern time. It's been amazing to hear listener stories and offer support and advice around topics such as parental alienation, narcissistic abuse, false allegations, and all those topics that high-conflict co-parenting seems to include. So join us every Wednesday via Zoom or whenever you can make it. The only requirement is that you become a Patreon non-impossible VIP. Just go to patreon.com slash cpdilemmas to learn how. It's only $10 a month and a great way to be with others who just need to hear that, like you, they're not crazy. Sign up today. Details are also in the show notes. We'll be back after a quick break. The heart behind the I'm On podcast is storytelling because every mom has a story to tell. I know that when I talk to my friends who are parenting and we share stories, we all end up feeling less alone and more capable of loving our kids well. You can find information everywhere on the internet. Some is bad parenting advice and some is pretty wise. We like to think there's a lot of wisdom on imom.com and when you combine that signature wisdom with a great story, it brings parenting to life. We want a mom who's listening to see herself and her kids in these stories and rest in the confidence that she is the perfect mom for her kids. Check out the iMom podcast with new episodes every Monday. And I'll also say this. After I started to have overnights with my kids, there was a lot of brainwashing that had to be undone. Okay. And the best way to go about doing that is to, first off, show them, don't tell them, but show them that you're not the person that your ex claims that you are. If you react or respond emotionally, you will become everything that you're accused of doing. So don't be that person. Rise above that. And also, you have to reinforce the things in your kids that all kids need to hear, that they are loved deeply and unconditionally that you're proud of them, that you're so happy to be their parent, that you're so happy that they are your kids. You know, when I started first having overnights, my kids told me, Daddy, my brother and I don't want to sleep with you. I said, okay, <laughs> you don't have to sleep with me. You have your own beds. There's a lot of places to sleep, so uh, you know we don't have to talk about this. We can We can sleep wherever we want to. And now we make it a joke, you know, I, I ask my kids, hey, who wants to sleep in the kitchen? <laughs> or who wants to sleep in the bathroom tonight? And they start laughing. They say, not me. But anyway, back then, it was, they didn't want to sleep in the same bed as me. They didn't want to sleep in the same room as me. And that's okay. But I started to do the things that I wanted to do during the marriage. And that I tried to do as much as I can, but I was prevented from doing. and Which was singing them lullabies as they go to sleep. Or reading them a book before they go to sleep. And rubbing their chest as they're going to sleep and telling them how much I love them as they're going to sleep. And I'll tell you what, I saw the anxiety in my son melt away. I saw him breathe a deep breath as I was singing him a lullaby and smelling my hand the first night that he slept over. And I saw him heal from the trauma that he was experiencing. And I'm kind of tearing up as I'm saying this. Um, 
And I told my daughter, too, that I love her so much and I'm so proud of her. And that there's, you know, I love her more than she'll ever know. And I love her unconditionally. And so all the things that I just said, we made those into kind of word games. Not games, but, you know, we have fun with it. So when I tell her that I'll love her no matter what, you know, she starts asking me these funny questions. Like, Danny, what if I pick your nose? I'll still love you. What if I fart in your face? Well, honey, I'll still love you. What if I steal all your money and wipe a booger on your clothes? Okay, well, I'll still love you. I, I tell her, it doesn't matter what you do. I will still love you. It doesn't matter what anyone does. I will still love you. And it doesn't matter what anyone says. I will still love you, no matter what. And my love for you will do nothing but grow. And that made my daughter's anxiety go away. I don't want to say go away, but it alleviated a lot of the burden that she was holding on to. And I also removed the burden of having to feel guilty of hearing these bad things about me. I know that whenever she's with her mom, that she's not allowed to love me. And her mom reminds me all the time, when the kids are with me, they never want to talk to you. So, okay, they don't have to talk to me. That's okay. And the kids could tell you that they hate me. And that's okay. And I told my daughter, it's okay for you to go there and want to be with mom. It's okay for you not to think about me. I'll be okay. All right. And if people are saying bad things about daddy, I'm very sorry that you're being put into that. I'm being, I'm very sorry that you have to hear those things, but daddy's going to be okay. All right. Daddy's a very strong daddy. Actually, that is, doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt daddy. Daddy is strong. You have a really strong daddy. So it's okay. You don't have to think about me. You don't have to worry about me when you're with your mom. Okay. And she became a lot happier after hearing those things. Kids will do what they need to do to survive. And survival for them means being loved, being cherished, being focused on, and attention being paid to. That's survival for them. Now, if you think about Maslow's law, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's probably not as basic of a need as food and shelter. If you have those needs not being met, you have a much deeper problem. And if you're listening to this podcast and I'm sure you care deeply about your kids and you need to call whatever government agency there is if you fear that level of neglect. But assuming that your kids are being fed and clothed and there's shelter, then kids need love and attention and they need affection. They need praise and they need all of the love languages in copious amounts. So to them, that's survival and that's healthy. That's healthy for them to develop in the way that kids need development emotionally. So I relieve them from the burden of having to love me when they're with their mom, of having to think about me, and just get all the love they can while they're with her. Even if that love is tainted, even if that love requires them to hate me, that's okay. That is a-okay with me. So anyway, this was a bit of a heavy episode. I hope it helps. I hope this places some of the situation in in perspective with regards to the kids. And um, again, you're going to have to kill your ego. Kill your ego. Your ego is your worst enemy when it comes to this situation. When my kids are saying all those horrible things, okay, well, that's funny. I'm sorry to hear you. I'm sorry to hear you hear that. When I was on supervised and unsupervised visitations, I would try to go out and have some good times with my kids, like go to Starbucks and order a hot chocolate, for example, or go to the frozen yogurt shop after dinner. And I'm sure that my kids were telling their mom everything that was happening. In fact, I know for a fact, my daughter started to recite all the things that we did during that supervised visitation or unsupervised visitation before she went back to mom so that she could report back to mom what they did. Um, but at some point, my daughter started saying, no, daddy, I don't like sugar. No, daddy, I don't want hot chocolate. I don't like sugar. I don't like hot chocolate. No, I don't like ice cream, dad. No, I, I, I hate chocolate. No, I don't like it. And when I started trying to use logic on her, no, you, you love sugar. You love chocolate. You used to eat a lot of chocolate. That doesn't work. Kids are not logical. They are not logical beings. They are beings controlled by emotion and impulse. And that's normal. So as a happy uncle, like, quote unquote, okay, you don't like chocolate? Okay, whatever. Do you want milk? 
So we went from drinking hot chocolate at Starbucks every week to the kids getting warm milk. And over time, I started adding whipped cream. And on the whipped cream, I started adding chocolate syrup. And I would get a mouthful for my daughter every time she found the chocolate syrup, but she would eat the chocolate syrup. And for me, that was a win because it was a bit of, you know, it was sending the message. It's okay to have this kind of stuff when you're with your dad, you know, and nothing bad's going to happen. I'm not going to get mad. Mom's not going to die. The world's not going to end. And it's okay. And it's okay to have these good experiences with dad. Kill the ego. Focus on your children's interests, their children's emotional state, and just give them the things that they need. Give them love. Let them love their other parent as well. Even if their other parent is toxic, even if the other parent tells the children that, you know, mommy's going to die if daddy takes you, even if they say those kinds of horrible things, it's not your place to lash out. Okay, don't use your kids. Don't use your kids as the same weapons that your ex is using. Like, that's never okay. That's your fight. That's your battle. That's your burden. Don't use the kids. One professional told me, look, your kids are in the middle, and there's no way out for them. There is no way out for your kids. So you have to give them the emotional space and the comfort to be okay. You have to be that person. It sucks. In a perfect world, both you and your co-parent will be that people. And your kids would have two stable, normal, rational people that they could love and bond with. And that's normal. We don't live in normal. Your kids have no way out of the situation that they're in. Make it as comfortable for them as possible. Make it so that they don't get traumatized as much as they may, as much as they could get traumatized in the situation. If you react, they will get traumatized. Your anger will traumatize them. Your natural reaction, the natural reaction to this whole situation is anger. It's frustration. It's absurdity. It's everything that you want to do. And yet that's what's going to hurt the kids. So anyway, yeah, again, a bit of a heavy episode. I felt that this was important to talk about. And I hope it helps those of you who are going through something similar. If you have any questions, uh, you can email me at, um, you know, the email address is in the outro and I'll put in the notes as well. But email me, um, I'll try to help you as much as I can. I'm not a professional. I'm not licensed or anything like that. So don't expect textbook accurate conversations. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not any of those things. I'm just a normal person going through a horrible situation. But yeah, send me an email. I'm happy to talk to you about it. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, listeners. Many of you have inquired about online co-parent coaching. Diane and I don't have the time ourselves to provide that service, but the organization we both work for does. The Center for Navigating Family Change will be swamped with requests, so we want to give our co-parent dilemma listeners first dips. It's time to take advantage of having your own personal co-parent coach to help you respond to your difficult co-parent. The information contained in this podcast is generic. It must not be misconstrued as constituting legal or psychological advice. Decisions relevant to any specific individual, family system, or case require the direct evaluation of skilled, child-centered professionals.